Josh's smile introverted. He suddenly looked terrified and was struggling to get off the float, but he couldn't in a quick manner due to the awkward he had been laying on it. Each time he would fall back onto the float, screeching would intensify. I wanted to help Josh, but I couldn't move myself any closer. My legs wouldn't cooperate. I hated these woods. I picked up the flashlight that he had thrown and his thrashing and shined over the float, not knowing what to expect. Finally, Josh got up from the float and rushed next to me, looking where I was shining the light. Suddenly there it was. It was a rat. I started laughing nervously when we both watched a rat run into the woods, taking the screeches with it. Josh lightly punched me in the arm, the smile only returning to his face as we continued walking. We quickened our pace and made it out of the woods faster than we thought we would. We had found ourselves back in my old neighborhood. The last time I rounded a bend ahead, I had seen the house fully illuminated and all the memories of what transpired came flooding back. I felt a skipping in my heartbeat as we had finally turned in the corner and about to face the force of the full of my house. Remembering the last time in the load incandescent it was, but this time all the lights were off. From a distance, I could see an old climbing tree, and in my mind traced the steps casually backwards, realizing that I wouldn't be back here this night if that tree hadn't grown. I was briefly in awe of how the events were like that. As we got closer, I could see the lawn that looked terrible. I couldn't even guess where it had been last mowed. One of the shutters, practically broken and loose, was rocking back and forth into the breeze and over all over the house it just looked dirty i was sad to see my old home in such a day state of despair why would my mom care if we bothered the new owners if they cared a little about where we lived if then i realized there were no new owners the house was abandoned although it looked f simply forsaken why would my mom lie to us about the house having new people in it but i thought it was actually a good thing it would be easier to look for around boxes if we didn't have to worry about being spotted by the new family. This would make much quicker. Josh interrupted my thoughts and walked through the gate and up to the house itself. Your old house sucks, dude! He, Josh yelled as quietly as he could. Shut up, Josh! Even if it's like still nicer than your house. Hey, man! Okay, okay. I think boxes is probably under the house. One of us has to go under there and look but the other one should stay next to the opening in case if he comes running out. Are you serious? There's no way I'm going under there. It's your cat, man. You do it. Look, I'll game you for it. Unless you're too scared, I said, holding my fist up to my turned palm. Fine, but we go on shoot. And on free, not on free, it's rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Not one, two, free. I know that's how we play the game, Josh, but you're the one who's always messing it up. And so it's two out of three. I lost. I wiggled through the loose panel that my mom would always move when she had to crawl under there for boxes. She only had to do it a couple of times since she, the can opener trick usually worked. But when she had to do it, she hated it, especially the last time. As I looked into the darkness of the crawl space, I had a greater apparition as to why. Before we moved, she said that it would actually was better that boxes ran under there. Despite how hard it could be for him to get out, it was less dangerous than him jumping over the fence and running into the neighborhood. All that was true, but it was still dreading doing this. I grabbed my flashlight and walkie-talkie and began to crawl in. A powerful smell took over me. It smelled like death. I turned on my walkie-talkie. Josh, are you there? This is Macho Man. Come back. Josh cut it out. There's something wrong down here. What do you mean? It stinks. It smells like something died. Is it boxes? I really hope not. I sat down my walkie-talkie and moved my flashlight around as I crawled forward, looking through the hole from the outside. You could see all the way back with the, with the right lighting but you had to be inside to see around the support blocks that hauled the house up. I say there was about 40% of the area that you couldn't see unless you were actually in the crawl space, but even inside, I discovered you could only directly see where the flashlight was pointing. I realized that this would make scouting around and the place more difficult. 
as I moved forward, the smell intensify. The fear was growing in me that boxes had come here and had something happen to him. I shined my flashlight around, but I couldn't see much of anything. I wrapped my finger around the support block to pull myself up forward, and as I did, that I felt something that made my hand recoil. Fur. My heart sank and prepared myself emotionally for what I was about to see. I crawled back slowly so I could prolong what was coming. I inched my eyes and the flashlight passed the block to see what was at the other side. I staggered back in horror. Jesus Christ! Escaped from my trembling mouth. It was a hideous, twisted creature, badly decomposed. The skin had rotted away at its face and teeth, so it appeared to be enormous, and the smell was unbearable. What is it? Are you okay? Is it boxes? I reached for the walkie-talkie. No. No, it's not boxes. So what the hell is that? I don't know. I shined the light again and looked at it with less fear and vision, and I chuckled. It's a raccoon. Keep looking. I'm going to go in the house, see if he might have made it in somehow. What? No, Josh, don't go in there. What if boxes is down here and runs out? He can't. I put the board back. I looked and saw he was telling the truth. Why would you do that? Don't worry, man. You can move it easily. This makes more sense. If boxes ran out and I miss him, then he'd be gone. If he's down there, then grab him tight and I'll come move the board. If he's not, then you can move it yourself. While I look in the house. Some points of his were good, and I doubt he'd be in the, able to get in the way. But be careful and don't touch anything. There's a bunch of my old clothes still in the boxes in my room. You can look for him there and see if he crawled into one. And make sure you bring your walkie-talkie. Roger, Dad. Got it, buddy. I realized that it would be good pitch black in here. The power might have been turned off since no one was paying the bill. With uh, any luck, he'd be able to see the streetlights that might cast some light inside. Otherwise, I am not sure what he'd do. Before long... I heard footsteps right above my head. Felt old dirt raining down on me. Josh, is that you? <sniffs> breaker, breaker, this is Macho Man coming back for the big tango foxtrot. The eagle has landed. What's your 20, Princess Jasmine? Over. Asshole. Macho Man is my 20 is in your bathroom looking at the stash of magazines. Looks like he got a thing for dudes' butts. What's the report on that? Over. I could hear him laughing through without the walkie-talkie. I started laughing, too. I headed the footsteps fade away as he was little on his way to my room. Man, it's dark in here. Hey, are you sure you had boxes of clothes in here? I don't see any. Yeah, there should be a couple of boxes in the closet. There aren't any boxes in here. Let me check to see. You may have put the boxes in the closet before you left. I started thinking that maybe my mom may have come back and, for and gotten the clothes just to give them away, because I had outgrown a lot of them. But I couldn't remember leaving the boxes there, and I didn't just have enough time to close the last one up before we left. While I was waiting for Josh to tell me what he found, I kicked my, out my leg, which had started falling asleep. Because of the position I was in, I hit something. I looked back and saw something really strange. It was a blanket, and all around it were bowls, I crawled closer to it. The blanket smelled moldy, and most of the bowls were empty. But one had something that I recognized still in it. Cat food. It was a different kind of than we gave to boxes. But suddenly I understood. My mom had set up a little place for boxes to encourage him to come here instead of running around in the neighborhood. That made a lot of sense, and it seemed more likely that boxes would have come back to this place. That's cool, Mom, I thought. I found your clothes. Oh, cool. Where are the boxes? Like I said, there are no boxes. Your clothes are in your closets. They're hanging up. I felt a chill. This was impossible. I packed all of my clothes, even ones that weren't supposed to move for another two weeks when we moved. I remember packing them, thinking it was stupid of me, me to have to get the clothes out of the boxes and put them back in. I had packed them, but when someone hung them back up, why, though? Josh needed to get me out of here. That can't be right, Josh. They're supposed to be in boxes. Stop messing around and just come back outside. No joke, man. I'm looking at them. Maybe you just thought you left them. Haha, <laughs> wow. You sure like to look at yourself, don't you? 
Wait, what do you mean? Your walls, man. Ha <laughs> ha. I mean, your walls are covered in paraloids of yourself. There are like hundreds of them. What have you to hire someone to? Silence. I checked my walkie-talkie to see if I had switched it off somehow, and it was fine. I could hear the footsteps, but couldn't tell exactly where Josh was going. I waited for Josh to finish his sentence, thinking that his finger just slipped off the off button, but he didn't continue. He seemed to be stomping around the house now, just about to radio him when he came back. There's someone in the house. His voice was hushed and broken. I could hear that he was on the verge of tears. I wanted to respond, but how loud his walkie-talkie turned up. What if the other person heard it? Like I said, nothing, and just waited and listened. And what I heard were footsteps, heavy dragon footsteps, and a loud foot. Oh God, Josh? He had been found, I was sure of it. This person had found him and was hurting him. I broke out in tears. He was my only fan, friend, next to boxes. And then I realized, what if Josh told him I was under there? What could I possibly do? I struggled to compose myself. Thankfully, I heard Josh's voice through the walkie-talkie. He's got something, man. It's a big bag. He just threw it onto the floor, and oh god, the bag. I think it just moved. I was paralyzed. I wanted to run home. I wanted to save Josh, and I wanted to go for help. I wanted so many things, but I just lay there and frozen. As I lay unable to move, my eyes were focused on the corner of the house that was right underneath my room. I moved my flashlight, my breath hitched at what I saw. Animals, dozens of them, all dead. They lay in piles all around the perimeter of the crawl space. Could boxes be among these corpses? Was that what the cat food was for? Seeing this broke my shock, and I knew I had to get out of there. I scrambled to the board, so I pushed it, but it won't budge. I couldn't move it because it was wedged onto there and I couldn't get my fingers around it since the edges were outside. I was trapped. God damn you, Josh, I whispered to myself. I could feel the thunderous footsteps above me. The house was shaking, and I could hear Josh scream, and it was matched by with another scream that wasn't full of fear. I continued pushing until I felt the board move. I knew it wasn't me who was moving it. I could hear the footsteps above me and in front of me, shouting and screaming, filling with belief, belief silences, between the steps. I moved back and held my walkie, ready to defend myself. The board was thrown onto the side and an arm shot in to grab me. Let's go, man, now! It was Josh, thank God. I scrambled out of the opening, fold, holding the flashlight and walkie-talkie. When we got to the fence, we both jumped it, but Josh's walkie fell and he reached for it. I told him to forget it, we had to move. Behind us, I could hear yelling. They weren't words, only sounds. We perhaps foolishly ran for the woods and tried to get back to Josh's quicker than someone harder to follow. The whole way through the woods, Josh kept yelling, My picture! He took my picture! But I already knew the man had Josh's picture from all those years ago at the ditch. I suppose Josh still might have those mechanical sounds from a robot. We made it back to Josh's house and back into his room before his parents woke up. I asked him about the big bag and if it really moved. He said he couldn't be for sure. He kept apologizing without dropping the walkie at the house. But obviously that wasn't a big deal. We didn't go to sleep and sat out peering the window waiting for him. I went home later that day as it was around 3 a.m. I told my mom the basics of the story a couple days ago. She broke down and was furious about the danger I put myself in. I asked her why she made up those things about me bothering the new owners just to stop me from going. Why did she think the house was so dangerous? She became irate and hysterical, but she answered my question. She grabbed my hand and gently squeezed it, and I thought her capable of and locked her eyes with mine, whispering as if she was afraid of being overheard. Because I never put any fucking blankets or bowls down there for boxes, you weren't the only one to find them. I felt dizzy. I understood so much now. I understand why she looked uneasy after she brought boxes out from underneath the house of her last day there. She found more than spiders and rats nests that day. I understood why we left almost two weeks early. 
I understood why she tried to stop me from going back. She knew that she would make his home under ours. She kept it from me. I left without saying another word. And why didn't she finish the story for her? But I wanted to finish it here for you. I got home from Josh's that day, threw my stuff onto the floor, and scathed everywhere. I didn't care. I just wanted to go to sleep. I woke around 9 p.m. to the sound of boxes meowing. My heart leapt, and I heard him finally come home. I was a little sick about the fact that if I had just waited a day, none of the previous night's events would have ever happened, and I had boxes anyway. But that didn't matter. He was back. I got off my bed and called for him, looking around such a glint of his eyes. The crying continued, and I followed it. It was coming from under the bed. I laughed a little, thinking that he just crawled under the bed looking for him. How was this so much better? His meows were being muffled by a shirt. I flung to his side and started smiling and yelling, Welcome home, boxes! His cries were coming from my walkie-talkie. Boxes never came home. There was a comment on my last post that he made me remember the event from my childhood that I always took as odd, but never considered it to be related to any of these stories. I know what it is. It's funny how memories work. The details might always be present in your mind, though scathed and disrayed, and then a single go thought that could stitch them back up almost instantly. I never thought of these events, much because I was focused on the wrong details. I went back to my mom's house and went through my old childhood schoolwork looking for something that is as important. I couldn't find it, but I'll keep looking again. Sorry for the length. Most cities around the neighborhood in them weren't planned with, though the thought of the population would begin to grow exponentially and it would be more accommodated. The layout of the roads was generally originally in response to the geographical restrictions of the necessity of connecting points to the atomic importance. Once the connecting rods are established, new businesses and roads were positioned strategically along the existing skeleton, and eventually the paths carved into the earth were more immobilized and absalt, leaving the room for minor modifications, additions, and altercations, but I never felt the dramatic change. My childhood neighborhood must have been old if it lines were moved as the crow flies, then my neighborhood must have been built this based on the travels of, of a snake. The first houses built must have been placed around the lake, a gradually inhabitable area increased as the new extensions were built off the original path, but these extensions were all made abruptly at one point or another. There was only one entrance or exit for the entire neighborhood. Many of the extensions were limited by a trebly to which both fed and drank from the lake and passed right by what I call home, and I have called in these stories the ditch. Many of the original homes were enormous yards, but most of the original plots have been divided, leaving properties with smaller and smaller boundaries. When a aerial view of my neighborhood, he would, would give out the impression and that when enormous squid that had once died in those woods, some adventure interpreter the found corpses and pave rods over its tentacles. Only withdraw its involvement and leave time, greed and exasperation to divide up the land amongst the prospective homeowners, like embarrassing attempts to the golden radio. From my porch you could see the old houses that surrounded the lake, but the houses of Miss Maggie was my favorite. She was the best as I can remember, around 80 years old, despite that she was one of the friendliest people I've ever met. She had a head of a loose set, white curls that were always more light with dresses with floral patterns. She would talk to me and Josh from her back porch when we were swimming by the lake. She would always invite us in for snacks, and she would always say that she was lonely because her husband Tom always was away on business. But Josh and I would always decline her invitation because as nice as Miss Maggie was, there was something a bit odd about her. Every now and then when we would swim away, she would say, Chris and John, you are welcome here anytime. 
and we could hear her still yelling at us when we were walking back to my house. Maggie, like many of the other older homeowners, had a sprinkler system that was on a timer, though at some point over the years, her timer must have been broken because the sprinklers would come on at various points during the day, often at night all year. While it never got old enough to snow very much, several times each winter, I would go outside of the winter to see Miss Maggie's yard, transformed into a surreal, attic paradise by the frozen water. Every other yard would stood sterilized and dry by the biting frost of the winter's cold, but right there in the middle of the bleak reminder of the salvagery of the season was an oasis of beautiful ice hanging from the static like tights from the every branch of the tree and every leaf of the bush. As the sun rose, it reflected off of each piece of ice splintered into the sun of a rainbow that would only be viewed briefly before it blinded you. Even as a child, I was struck by how beautiful it was, and often Josh and I would ever go there on walk on the iced grass, and even have sword fights with the icicles. I once asked my mom why she left it like that, and my mom seemed to search for an explanation before she said, Well, sweetie, Miss Maggie is sick a lot, and sometimes when she gets really sick, she gets confused. That's why she messes up yours and Josh's name sometimes. She doesn't mean to, but sometimes when she can't remember, she lives in that big house all by herself. So it's okay if you talk to her when you swim in the lake, but when she invites you in, you should keep saying no, be polite, her feelings won't get hurt. But she'll be less lonely when her husband comes home, right? How long will he be away on business? It seems like he's away, always away. My mom seems to struggle, and I could see that she had become very upset. Finally, she answered, Honey, Tom is not going to be coming home. Tom is in heaven. He died years ago, but Miss Maggie doesn't remember. She gets confused and forgets. But Tom's not coming home. If someone moved back in with her, she might even think it was Tom. But he's gone, sweetie. I could have only been around five or six when she told me that. And while I didn't understand it completely, I was still profoundly sad for Miss Maggie. I know Miss Maggie had Alzheimer's, and she and her husband, Tom, had two sons, Chris and John. The two had worked out payments with the utility companies and paid for Miss Maggie's water and electricity, but they would never visit her. I don't know if something happened to them, or if it was the illness, or if they just lived too far away, because they never came around. I have no idea what they looked like, but there were often times Miss Maggie thought that Josh and I looked like what they did as they were children. Or maybe she saw some part of her mind desperately wanting her to see, ignoring the images transmitted down her own optic nerve and just for a little while showing her what it used to be. I realize now how lonely she must have been. During the summer after kindergarten, before the events of balloons, Josh and I had taken exploring in the woods near my house, as well as tribality of the lake. We knew that the woods between our houses were connected, and we thought of it. It would be neat if the lake was near my house, and was somehow connected to the creek around this. So we resolved in our own selves to find it. We were going to make maps. The plan was to make two separate maps, and then combine them. We would make one map for exploring the area around the creek near his house, and would make another following the outflow of my lake. Originally we were going to make it one map, but we decided that it wasn't possible since I had started drawing the area of my map so huge from the route that from his house it wouldn't have been too upscale. We have kept the map from the lake, and we have the map from the lake to the creek at the house. We would add each other when we stayed overnight with each other. For the first couple of weeks went really well. We would walk through the woods along the water and pause every couple of minutes to check on the map. And it seemed like the two maps would come together. Any day, we had no equipment needed for the job, not even a compass, but we even tried to make a do. do. We had the idea to impale the earth with a stick when we had it attached to the end of the venture so that if we came upon the stick from the other side of the direction next weekend, 
we would know if we had joined the maps. We might even have the world's biggest, biggest worst cartographers. Eventually, however, the woods became too thick near the water, coming from the lake when we were unable to proceed further. We lost interest in the whole project for a bit and reduced our exploration significantly, though not completely, when we had started selling snow cones. After I showed my mom all the pictures I have taken from home to school and she took away my snow cone machine, our interest in the maps redevised, so we had to come up with another plan. Although I didn't want to understand why my mom had placed it, what I consider to be extremely severe restrictions of what I could do and where I could go, I had to check in frequently when I went to go play outside with Josh. This meant that we couldn't stay in the woods for hours and would look for a new path. We just thought that we could swim when we got a cut off in the woods, but that was clearly didn't work since the map we got would get wet. We tried going faster when we were coming from Josh's house, but we eventually ran into the same problem. Then we had a brilliant idea. We built a raft. Due to the construction of the neighborhood, there was a large amount of scrap building material that the company would sit in the ditch to keep it out of the road and off site since they're no longer going to need it for the building. We originally conceived a formable ship complete with the mast and anchor but this quickly dismissed into something that was imaginable. We set aside the wood and took several large deep breaths and pieces of styrofoam that were packed and with the form board and tied together with rope and kite string. We launched our vessel down a little bit of the water from Miss Maggie and waved a farewell to her as she motioned us to come back to her anyway. But there was no stopping us. The raft worked very well and while we both behaved well and spoke with the functionally of the raft was given, I know at least I was a little surprised. We each had a fairly long tree branches to use as a paddle, but we found it much easier to simply push against the land and under the water than we usually see them as attended. When the water became too deep, we simply lie on our stomachs and use our hands to paddle the water which still worked a bit less well, while the first time we had to resort to the method of propulsation. I remember thinking about it from too far. It must have looked, well, calls a lossily fat man with tiny arms out for a swim. It actually took us several trips to get to the raft from the impassable patch of woods that was marked with the farthest and we made it. After we had come up with the idea of marking the ground with the stick, we had continued it running through the woods until we got the stick, and then carefully, precisely as we know, charting our course, this meant our in pace and actually quite a bit away. We So we sailed from the, around the house all the way to the blockade of the woods, it was taking longer than we expected. We sailed for a bit and then dock on the raft, and then the next time we'd run for the woods to get the raft and go a little farther. We continued this into the first grade. Josh and I were assigned to different groups that year, so since we didn't really see another during each other do during the school day, our parents were more willing to let us hang out all weekends each week. What's more, Josh's dad had taken on a lengthy construction job that required him to work over the weekends, and his mother was on call, so this meant Josh would stay at my house most of the weekend for weeks on end. So we should have been making good progress, but when we finally chose to imply and had the opportunity to explore past it, we couldn't find the place to dock the raft. The woods were simply too thick and the water adored the land to the point where there was nearly two feet a rise above the earth, to which it was tributarily, which exposed the twisting and damp roots above the trees. We'd love have our backs turned away every time and leave the raft at the same thick of the trees that prompted us to build it in the first place. Even the worst winter had arrived, so we couldn't justify leaving the house in our swimsuits. We were getting nowhere. We were always had to come home when it gained much ground. On a Saturday night around 7 p.m., Josh and I were playing one of my mom's co went playing when one of my mom's co-workers knocked on our door. Her name was Samantha, 
And I remember her well because I would propose a couple of years later when I was visiting my mom at work. My mom said that she had to go to work to fix a problem that had arisen, but she'd come back in about two hours. Her car was being repaired, so she loved to have a ride, ride with, with Samantha. But I gathered that the problem was Samantha's fault and discussing it at the car why it would only take two hours. She said it was under no circumstances that we were to leave the house or open the door for anyone, and she was in the middle of explaining what she would do call every hour when she got there just to check in, but ended that statement prematurely when she remembered our phone had been turned off for, for dequilent payments. This was on why now Samantha had just come by unannounced. She looked at me dead in the eyes while closing the door and said, stay put. This was our chance. We watched her drive down the serpentine road towards the exit. And as soon as the car rounded the last visible bend, we ran back to my room. I dumped my backpack out while Josh grabbed the map. Hey, do you have a flashlight? Josh chimed. No, but we'll be back before dark. I was just thinking just in case we should have one. My mom has one, but I don't know where she keeps it. Wait. I ran into my closet and pulled out a box down from the top shelf. You have a flashlight in there? Josh asked. Not exactly. I opened the box and revealed to be Roman candles that I had taken from the pile that my mother had embarrassed from the 4th of July that past summer, along with the lighter that I had managed to take her from many months before. This would ensure at least had some light if we needed it. This was a bit bit before I had given the opportunity to be afraid of the woods at night, so it wasn't a fear that motivated our search for the light source. Only practically, we threw the backpack on and bolted out of the back door, making sure to close it so boxes wouldn't get out. We only had an hour and 50 minutes. We ran through the woods as fast as we can and made it to the raft in about 15 minutes. We had our bathing suits under our clothes, so we stripped them off our shirts and shorts and then left them to grab two separate piles for our feet below the edges of the water. We untied the raft from the tree, grabbed our branch paddles, and cast them off. We tried to move rapidly to the point where Beyond the Continents was ever expanding the map. As we didn't have time to waste seeing old sights, we knew that it was slower in the raft than on the land, and we had had wood be in the raft for quite a while after the cutoff, since the woods were too thick and walked right through there, wasn't a place to dock. This meant that we would have to ride the raft back to the original docking site, even if we found a new place to dock it further ahead. After we passed the last charted part of our map, the water began to get really deep, and eventually we could no longer touch the bottom with our tree branches. So we lay on our stomachs and paddled with our hands, getting darker, and as a result, it was becoming harder to distinguish the trees from the other, and we both became slightly unnerved, in our interest of making good time, we were paddling fast with our arms, but this caused a lot of noise as our hands repeatedly confronted and then broke through the water surface tension. During these periods, we could both hear the crunching of dead leaves and the snapping of fallen trees and sticks in the woods. To our right, we could slow our pace and quiet our actions. The rustling in the woods would cease and we began to wonder if it was really there at all. We didn't know what kinds of animals resided this far into the woods, but we did know that we did not wish to find out. As Josh amended the map and I was illuminated with the lighter, we were suddenly confronted with the fact that the sounds were not imagined. Rapidly and rhythmically, we heard a crunch, snap, crunch. It seemed to be moving slightly away from us, pushing through the woods just beyond our map. It had become too dark to see. We had misjudged how long the sun would linger. I nervously called out, Hello? There was a brief moment of tension. We lay static in the water. The silence was really broken by laughter. Hello? Josh cackled. So what? Hello, Mr. Monster in the Woods. I know you're sneaking around, but maybe you'll answer to my hello. Hello? I realized how stupid it was. Whatever animal it was, it wouldn't respond. 
I hadn't even realized I had said it till afterwards. But if anything was actually there, I obviously wouldn't get a reply. Josh continued, Hello? In a high, flacio tone. Hello? I counter as a deep bar tone as I could manage. Hello there, mate. Hello, beep boop. Hello. We continued mocking each other, and we were in the process of turning the raft around it to head back when we heard, Hello. It was, and it forced us as we were powered by the last breath of deflated lungs. But it didn't sound stick sickly, and it came from the spot just off the map, which now sat behind us since we both had turned the raft around. I slowly shifted in on the raft and faced the direction of where the sound was. I fumbled with the Roman candle. I just wanted to see. What are you doing? Josh hissed. But I already had it. As the sparkling fuse sunk into the wrapper, I held it towards the sky. I never actually shot one of these myself, and I just thought that it was just like the fuse and the flare in the movies. Growing up, a glowing green orb rocketed out towards the stars and then quickly extinguished. I lowered my arm towards the horizon. I could remember that there were several colors, but I couldn't remember how many times one of these were fired before being depleted. A second ball of red light burst and fizzled above the trees, but I saw nothing. Let's just go, man, Josh pre-pressed. He then turned the face the direction back home and paddling desperately. Just one more. Lowering my arm directly at the woods in front of me, another red ball of fire was launched into the tube. I, it traveled straight ahead until it collided with the tree, briefly exploding the light into a much greater demeanor. Still nothing. I dropped the firework in the water as I watched as one more struggling the fireball to burst free, only to quickly die and suffocate in the water. As we began paddling in the direction towards my house, we heard a loud, unconcealed rustling in the woods. The breaking of the branches and the trampling of the fallen leaves overpowered the sound of splashing. It was running. Our panic, we just off the violent too quickly and felt one of the ropes under my chest loosened. Josh, be careful! But it was too late. Our, after our raft breaking, before too long, it had completely fallen apart. We both held each other a desperate piece of styrofoam, but the pieces weren't big enough to keep us desperately afloat, and our legs just dangled beneath us in the winter water. Josh, quick! I yelled as I pointed at the water right next to him. He scrambled, but it was too cold to move quickly. We both watched as the map floated away. I'm c c c cold, my man. Josh stuttered de dejectedly. Let's get out of the water. We approached shore, but each time we attempted to pull ourselves up, we heard the frantically rustling and thundering towards us from the woods above. Eventually, we were too cold or too weak to even try anymore. Steadily, we kicked our legs and found ourselves nearing the dockside. We toppled off the debris and tried to pull it on land, but Josh's piece slipped down and floated away in the direction of the lake. We took off our swimsuits boots, and desperate to get into dry clothes to shield us from the biting chill of the air. I slid my shorts, but there was something wrong. I turned to Josh. Where's my shirt, man? He struggled and suggested. Maybe I got knocked into the water and floated into the lake? I told Josh to go back to my house and to do what we were playing inside of hide and seek if my mom was ever home. I had to try to find my shirt. I ran behind the house and peered over the water and scouted along the shoreline. It occurred to me with that luck, maybe I could find the map too. I was moving pretty fast because I needed to get home and was about to give up when my concentration was interrupted by a sound just coming from behind me. Hello? I whipped around. It was Miss Maggie. I had never seen her at night before, and this poor light, she had looked exceedingly frail. With the usual warmth that wrapped around her manner, it seemed to be as much snuffed out by the chill. I couldn't even remember ever seeing her like this without a smile. Her face looked strange. Hello, Miss Maggie. Oh, hi, Chris. The warm and smile had returned to her, even if the memories would not. I couldn't see it if it was you it was dark out there. 
Jokingly, I asked her if she was going to invite me for a snack, but she said maybe another time. I was too busy looking for my map and my shirt to really engage her. But she sounded too happy, and I didn't feel bad. She said a couple of things, but I was too distracted to pay attention. I said goodnight and ran down the driveway toward my house. Behind me, I could hear the walking across the frozen yard, but I didn't turn around to wave. I had to get home. I made it home just a couple of minutes before my mom did, and when she came in, Josh and I already changed clothes and warmed up. We had gotten away with it, even though we lost the map.